they consider the fourth to be that which is not conscious of the internal world, nor conscious of the external world, nor conscious of both the worlds, nor a mass of consciousness, nor a simple consciousness, nor unconsciousness, which is unseen beyond empirical dealings, beyond the grasp of the organs of action, uninferrable, unthinkable, indescribable, whose valid proof consists in the single belief in the self in which all phenomena cease and which is unchanging, auspicious, and non-dual. That is the self, and that is to be known. Namaste. So this is the seventh mantra of the Mandukya Upanishad. And like we said last time, this consciousness of consciousness, awareness of awareness, the belief in the self, the belief that I am and I am aware, the certainty of that belief, the repeatability and reliability of that belief is the verification of the existence of this fourth state of consciousness, Turiya. Turiya is more or less identical with Brahman. In the stage of Savikalpa Samadhi, when we are still aware of the world through the senses, this Turiya is the consciousness of the consciousness. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose, throat, tongue, <laughs> chest, consciousness of energy, consciousness of thoughts, all these different varieties of consciousness. And we can, of course, imagine many, many more. But all of them are perceived through the fundamental substrate of awareness of awareness, consciousness of consciousness. We are conscious that we're conscious. We are aware that we're aware. And that is Turiya, by definition. So, everybody is already Brahman realized. Everybody is already the self. See, this is why the self is unborn. Unborn means uncaused. Uncaused means that Brahman or the self, Turiya, is the absolute with a capital A. And what is the absolute with a capital A? <laughs> It is precisely the uncaused substrate of everything. And that's Brahman. And that's what we are deep down inside, covered by these other layers of different kinds of consciousness that may be internal or external, but still their duality. And these are called upadis. And the upadis range all the way from, you know, a bacteria, <laughs> I guess, or a, a rock, you know, all the way up to the super consciousness of the supreme demigods like Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. So these upadis, being duality, are actually illusion. But that's okay. That's okay. Because they are not caused by the Absolute. Mark this point. Just as Brahman is not caused by anything, it simply is. In the same way, the creation, the world, the universe, is not caused by Brahman. Even though Brahman is the material of everything, 
the actual existence of everything, because Brahman is existence absolute. Brahman is also consciousness or awareness absolute. And that awareness of awareness is the fundamental layer of all consciousness. So Brahman is uncaused, and similarly, it does not cause anything else. Because to be a cause means Brahman would have to be related with that thing that it causes. Huh? But it doesn't cause anything because it's not related <laughs> with anything. It is simply Brahman, being consciousness and bliss, eternal and absolute, at the core, at the substrate, at the bottom of everything. <laughs> so you see, this is why <laughs> people who have realized Brahman are so blissful. Because there's nothing to not be blissful about. They see the world as unborn. Why? Because it's made of Brahman. And Brahman is never born. The difference is, the one difference is that the created things are subject to time. And time is Vishvarupa. Exactly what we've been talking about in these purports or tikas that Shankaracharya wrote on Manduki Upanishad. This is the series. And what that means is that there is no possible relationship of Brahman either as a cause or as an effect. To have consciousness, you have to have the relationship. Subject and object and the relationship between them. This triple is the ontological atom, the basic unit of existence. But this kind of existence is relative because it's always based on Brahman, even though Brahman isn't actually a part of it. <laughs> it's like the snake and the rope, okay? It's not that the rope causes the snake. It's not that the snake is somehow born from the rope. They simply don't have any relationship because the snake is completely imaginary. How can an imaginary thing have a relationship with a real thing? In the same way, how can Maya or any of the phenomena, the vast array of phenomena within Maya have any relation to the absolute? Because the absolute is not a cause of Maya. Yes, Maya arises on the substrate of Brahman, but Maya is not caused by Brahman. Just put that in your pipe and smoke it every day for a few weeks and you'll see that your relationship with everything will change. <laughs> because you realize if Brahman cannot be a cause of anything, yet is aware of everything, Brahman cannot be an effect of anything either. And that's true. And that's why he says in this verse, uninferable, unthinkable, indescribable, beyond the grasp of the organs of action. That includes the mind and the intellect. They cannot grasp Brahman because Brahman is inherently ungraspable by anything. It is never an object of the process of knowledge. Knowing requires a knower, <laughs> and that which is known, and the knowledge between them as a relation. But there is no such triplicity or duality in Brahman so it can't be known. <laughs> it is one of those class of entities that can only be inferred from the evidence. 
Now, just because these are uncaused or transcendental or whatever it is that makes them invisible, imperceivable, yet we can know from their effects that they must exist because the cause is inherent in the effect. Now the world, we know, is maya. It's an illusion because it's temporary. But yet, it is such a vast effect with so much complex internal structure and qualities. I mean, it's amazing. It must be the effect of a supremely intelligent and powerful cause. And the only cause that comes anywhere near that, that we know of, is Brahman. Therefore, Maya Shakti is called Saguna Brahman, or Brahman with qualities. This is the realm of Savikalpa meditation, Savikalpa Samadhi. But then when we realize Brahman, it turns into Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Samadhi without thoughts, without qualities. Because even if apparent thoughts apparently arise in the apparent mind, which is connected with this apparent body, I mean, apparently. <laughs> like the shloka says, the shloka we read last time says, when there is duality, as it were, in other words, illusory duality, because duality is always illusory. There is no duality. There is only Brahman. But it appears that there is duality, and different phenomena appear within that duality, following the rules of duality. This leads to a very interesting conclusion, which will be the subject of our next video. The relativity of the different states of consciousness. What is real? What is true? What is reliably predictable in one state of consciousness can and often does appear to be false, illusory, random, and unpredictable in another state of consciousness. So, in other words, what is real depends on where your attention is and what state of consciousness you are emphasizing at the moment. However, if you check into it, if you observe, you will find that Turiya is always real. Turiya is never seen as an illusion unless we're so covered over by Jagrat consciousness that our intelligence is dull and we can't grasp the idea of the Absolute. But the Absolute is completely necessary. I'll tell you why. If there was not one single uncaused entity that somehow or other gives rise to everything else, then nothing could exist. Because everything would have a cause, and that would have a cause, and that would have a cause, and so on and so on. This is called a regressus infinitum. Infinite regress of logical relationships. A causes B, but then what causes A? Z, maybe. <laughs> and back, back, back you go until you come around to A again. And you say, wait a minute. <laughs> This is what the scientists do. This is why they have to narrow the scope of their experiments and their theories to very limited contexts to get them to work at all. A scientist trying to describe a phenomenon in the wild is just overwhelmed. There's too many variables. It has to be simplified. It has to be laboratory conditions, 
which really means narrowing the scope, narrowing the context until the theory works. That's it. You can find every phenomenon in the world somewhere. So the only way to reliably get it to work, you know, like in a machine or in technology, is to narrow down the scope until it always is true. But anyway, we'll get into that in the next one. In the meantime, happy Nirvikalpa Samadhi. <laughs> Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.